Thank you for uh, talking about that, because it's a very personal subject. No, no, not at all. I'm, I'm quite proud of it. My first book was paid for almost entirely by property page pictures for the Telegraph. And I'd drive up to Norfolk, and uh, you just do, and sometimes you didn't get out of the car. You just wound down the window, <laughs> shot the front, <laughs> and then drive all the way back again. And I got 145 quid for each one, plus the mileage and the petrol. If you lead an interesting life, Good pictures will happen. Oh, nice. You might well be my sexiest sounding guest. Go somewhere you've never been before and take a camera. We had this gorgeous Mediterranean light just flowing in. Which as do we win? A Dartford. Very nice. Your first 10,000 pictures of your worst. Let's sit down. Let's have a cup of tea. Welcome to the show. Ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to another episode of the Standout Photography Show, episode 21, with me, Matthew Walker, where, as always, it is my honour and privilege to sit down with the finest working photographers in the world to unpack their systems, workflows, and find out what enables them to perform consistently at the very top of their profession and of course provide you with the very same principles that you can test and apply to your own photography. Before I introduce our guest today, is there someone that you would like to hear on the Standout Photography Show? If so, do let me know over on the Twittergrams at Matthew D. A. Walker. That is at Matthew D. A. Walker. And, of course, are you enjoying listening to the finest working photographers in the world? If so, please support the show with your words, not your wallets. It takes less than 60 seconds to leave a review on Apple Podcasts, which many of you have done, and I am extremely, extremely grateful because it does make a huge difference in securing the very finest photographers in the world with very busy schedules. Speaking of which, please allow me to introduce today's guest, none other than Mr. Simon Norfolk. That is at Simon Norfolk Studio on Instagram and simonnorfolk.com on the World Wide Webs. Simon is a landscape photographer whose work over 20 years has themed around a probing and stretching of the meaning of the word battlefield in all its forms. As such, he has photographed in some of the world's worst war zones, but is equally at home photographing supercomputers used to design military systems. He has work held in major collections, such as the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston, the Getty in Los Angeles, as well as San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, the Wilson Center for Photography, and the Sir Elton John Collection. His work has been shown widely and internationally, from Brighton to Ulaanbaatar, and in 2011 his work, Burke and Norfolk, was one of the first ever photography solo shows at Tate Modern in London. My conversation with Simon is everything and more that I wanted to achieve from the standout photography show. It's honest passionate there's no fluff but more importantly we deep dive into the reasons why Simon's work is so incredibly unique and why he has quite rightly been described by one critic as the leading documentary photographer of our time. Throughout our conversation we discuss layered landscape photography, the advantages of photographing very early in the morning, making photographs rather than taking photographs, shooting raw only for National Geographic, getting it right in camera, accessing the unaccessible and having structure to enhance creativity a la Peter Dench, growing your Instagram audience and crucially how important it is to your clients. This is something I'll be honest, I've been aware of for quite some time, but I hadn't quite realised how important very high-profile clients view your social media presence. It was a real, real eye-opener. Writing detailed captions, keeping your lifestyle and research lean, and of course, using a compass. Without further ado, please switch off from the world and enjoy my conversation with none other than Mr. Simon Norfolk. 
Without further ado, Simon Norfolk, it is a huge pleasure to say welcome to the Stand Up Photography Show. Thank you very much for joining me. Oh, you're very welcome, Matthew. Now, where in the world are we speaking to you today? Oh, I'm in uh, Hove. Uh, I'm, uh, I have a flat uh, overlooking the sea on Hove Seafront. You have, and obviously the listeners can't see this, but you have a very lovely image behind you. Where is that from? Oh, this thing on the wall behind me? Yeah. Uh, it's uh, one of my pictures from uh, Baghdad. It's the Ministry of Planning that was uh, burned and looted uh, during the American invasion of Baghdad in 2003. Wow. It is a stunning image. Uh, yeah, it was, it was burned. It was robbed. It was yeah robbed and then it was looted and then burned and then the Americans bombed it and then it got burned again. Out of interest, and I know people can't see this, so I'll link to it in the show notes, but how, how tall is that building? Because from, from oh, here... I'm on looks... a bridge. Ah, I see, I see. I'm on the... I'm on the there's a very famous bridge over the Tigris in the middle of, uh, in the middle of uh, Baghdad, and, and I'm, I'm standing on the bridge looking at the facade of the building. Yeah. But these mysterious fires that were destroying the kind of uh, Baghdad, uh, the, the sort of Iraqi infrastructure was a big kind of mystery. Well, during the American invasion, the, you know, the National Library burned down, the archives burned down. Uh, and I, I was very interested in photographing that because it interested me a great deal, not just that palaces get bombed. I don't really give a damn if a palace gets bombed. But if, a, if a, an archive gets bombed or a National Library gets bombed, then this is the kind of raw material from which a nation makes its own history. You know, local newspaper reports from the 1920s, uh, legal cases from 1900, uh, land registry documents. That's the kind of raw material from which a nation draws its own identity of itself. Uh, and that, that interests me a great deal in Baghdad, because always that these colonial countries uh, have a very difficult time re-establishing that. It's easy for us. We've got, you know, 800 years of unbroken records. But mm. in a lot of these colonial countries, you have this kind of rupture where, uh, and unfortunately, uh, somebody, some little turd was setting fire to uh, the, all the libraries and the archives and this kind of thing as a way of kind of erasing Iraqi history down to a kind of nothingness. The, the work that I've done in Afghanistan over the last few years with uh, the AKTC, which is the Aga Khan Trust for Culture, and, and I do a lot of photographing their um, restoration of historical monuments, mm. but always with that work we make a set of prints and we put them back in the archive. And that's a way of like kind of restocking the kind of empty shelves. And I've also done, I've, I've actually done about three books in Afghanistan that no one knows about, which were um, historical uh, archives of photography, Photography that was done by other photographers, travellers, uh, wanderers, archaeologists in the 1960s, uh, and uh, I um, rescanned all the negatives and did all the Photoshop work, and then we created a book of the work because the number of photographers that been in Afghanistan between 1900 and 1970, you can count the fingers of one hand, and, and their work needs to be in the archives in Kabul. So it's a kind of restocking of the shelves of a, of a nation's history. I, I think that's quite important. Yeah, I completely agree. I think it's very important. You're clearly very <coughs> driven by the work that you do and i've asked this question at the start of pretty much every podcast i think and i've almost apologized for it because i felt it was almost ambiguous and it's why photography and then i i watched a ted talk with the author of start with why simon sinek and it suddenly it was like a light bulb moment i suddenly thought it's not ambiguous because without the why you've got no destination to aim for and you've kind of answered my question before I've asked it by talking about your work and that image behind you. But why well, photography I'd, I'd say, for you? I'd say I'm, I'm not really interested in photography, to be honest. Uh, I'm interested in I'm interested in history, uh, and I, I don't think of myself so much as a photographer, I'm much more of a kind of archaeologist, because I think archaeologists and that process of archaeology is much more interesting than photography. Uh, you take a picture of something, I don't give a damn what it looks like. I can switch on a computer. I can get a million pictures of what a thing looks like. What interests me as a photographer is to go to a landscape, uh, scrape through that surface layer and re-expose something which has been lost in its history, uh, pull it out of the land, blow the dust off, and go, hey, look what I found. Look at this, right? I found this there, right? Uh, and the places that excite me as landscapes are not those places that make great pictures. You know, I'm not interested in photographing that place in Lofoten or the um, the Faroes, where you know, all those photographers, landscape photographers, are going to photograph that bloody waterfall in the in the Faroe Islands or that beach in Iceland with the ice. Um, what interests me is uh, the landscapes. Interest me are those landscapes which contain layer upon layer upon layer of buried histories. You know, those histories that are like kind of stacked on top of each other like sedimentary strata. 
And a, a country like Afghanistan is interesting because it's like a, it's like a country of landslides where suddenly all of these historical layers are on top of each other. You can see where the ruins are, where the, you, know, you can see where in Kabul, you can see the, the, the Bala Hissar, which is the fortress that was built to defend the city against the Mongol invasion, for Christ's sake, right? It's still there on the top of the hill. On the other side of the hill, you can see uh, an American special forces base. And on the top of the hill is a huge balloon, like a huge uh, rigid uh, rear stat balloon, uh, which is carrying a whole load of surveillance equipment for the Americans to do complete surveillance of traffic, face recognition, voice recognition, mobile phones, uh, uh, surveillance, the whole thing. You can see those things in one, in one view in the center of Kabul. And in between it is the palace that was built by the Khan of Kabul in the 1890s uh, as a gift from the Germans as part of their kind of vying against the British in the, in, in, the, in, the, in the great game, you know. So all those histories are sort of sat lying on top of each other. All, they're all there in the landscape, but they're all buried down below. And if you get like a, what I call a kind of metaphorical slippage in the land, suddenly at, at once you can see these things. As you walk through a city like Kabul, you can see where the Russians were fighting over a building because there's loads of burnt out Russian APCs all over the landscape. You can see where the Americans were bombing because it goes house, 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 fecking great big hole, house, house, house. And that's a thousand pound JDAM bomb that took out a, a, an Al-Qaeda base. And so each of these different military interventions in a, in a place leave behind a different forensic trace because the weaponry is different, because the technology is different. If you want to defend yourself against cannon fire by the British, you build a certain kind of fortress, but that's not going to defend you against the Americans dropping planes from F-16. So each one of these technologies creates a different kind of military infrastructure or, and also a kind of military crime scene, the detritus that gets left behind in a landscape when you're just firing Kalashnikovs at each other like they're doing in the Civil War, just means that buildings are covered in bullet holes. But where are the Americans, the Americans don't fire Kalashnikovs. When the American soldiers come under fire, they back off a kilometer and they bring in an F-16 and it drops a thousand pound bomb. End of argument. And that leaves a different archaeological evidentiary for forensic trace in a landscape right you know these landscapes are kind of like i approach them like crime scenes or archaeological sites and my job is to kind of brush off the dust you know the newly fallen dust that fell kaboom dust tinkle 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 uh, and brush off the dust uh, and re-show these objects as evidence of crimes you know, evidence of crimes, because what interests me is this imperial history that as you know, a poor benighted country like Afghanistan is somewhere where great empires have wandered through one after another after another, not just the British, not just the Americans now, but in the 1870s, the British and then the Russians. And then before that, you know, and, uh, the, the Mongols and before that, the, you know, it goes back to Alexander the Great, for Christ's sake, right? It's two and a half thousand years of great imperial armies have swept through Afghanistan, trashed the whole damn lot, left a kind of layer of rubble. Each of these layers of rubble is different from the next one. Left a layer of rubble and then the next uh, insurgent, next, in, next invader, has built on top of that layer of rubble. Uh, and where you can see those l rubble layers, uh, that's for me is an exciting landscape. That's my kind of job as a photographer, I think. So it's more to do with crime scene, it's more to do with archaeology, really. Well, I was going to say, so you've in a way, photography is just a, a tool for you to yeah. to tell the stories and the things that you sure. want to do. Sure. If I could do it through grand opera or haiku, I'd do it that way. But I, I, don't, I don't have to do that. <laughs> it's probably not a very good place to start. Well, uh, but, you know, yeah, photography. I mean, I, I'm not particularly attached to photography. I don't really... I, you know, I don't really love photography. I don't spend my spare time going around photography shows for fun. Uh, I have very much a kind of love-hate. It's just a kind of tool in the toolbox, as far as I'm concerned. Well, you also have many tools, one of which is the written word as well, which we'll come on to a little bit later on. But when we spoke on uh, the phone the other day, you mentioned that you were an early riser. And then I saw some of your work that you've been doing recently around London with the lockdown situation. And well, yeah. I'm an early riser as well. And it got me thinking twofold, really. What does getting up early before kind of the rest of the world is awake because i read that you were up at 4 30 when you were doing the <laughs> lockdown images around london what does getting up that early offer you a personally and b as a photographer uh all right, well b, b first i mean um 
Uh, I think it's very inter- easy as a photographer to kind of wander into a place and go clickety clickety click. You know, particularly with di- with digital photography, you go clickety 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 click, and then you load them all into Lightroom or Capture One or whatever, and then you start kind of clicking through them, and in your head is the question: What was it I was trying to say? And that is a really stupid place to start asking that question, right? You should have asked that question when you had the camera in your hand, not when the sh- when the shoot is over and you're sat at home and they're all sitting in front of you, and you're Which, like, somewhere somewhere in here is the picture that says what I was trying to say. Where is it? Which is now, back is a, to a fundamentally stupid pro- process, right? Exactly, and it's what I was saying earlier. It's back to starting with why, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So, and I think you know, I think I'm rather blessed by the fact that I started out on five four film photography, uh, which was horribly expensive. So you did not ever go clickety clickety click because that's like three hundred quid. Mm. Uh, so you have to have a very you know you got to line up your ducks. You got to have a very clear idea of why I'm in this place. What does that want to say? When is the best time to say it? Maybe I should be here this time of year. Maybe I shouldn't be here this time of day. Maybe I should point my camera in a different direction. Maybe I should get a different kind of camera. Maybe I should be standing in a cherry picker 60 feet in the air. I'm only going to shoot one picture, make it the correct picture, not shoot click, 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 and hope to God somewhere in there's a good one. I think that's a fundamentally stupid photographic uh, uh, method. So, um, uh, and, and one of the things I like about first thing in the morning is that... Um, you're not under quite, I mean, you're under time pressure, but I mean, you just create that yourself, but you don't have all the other things to deal with because the landscapes are empty. There's no security guards. There's no cops about. You don't have to wait for buses and trucks to move out of the way. It, you've kind of got the place to yourself and, and, and then you can have a think and just get your head in order. And then you can make the picture that you want. I only want to make one picture in the morning. I don't want to make 30 mediocre pictures. I want to make one great picture. Don't ever show your mediocre pictures. People just think you're mediocre, right? Just show the good ones. Uh, and I reckon if I shoot one a day, that's that's me firing on all cylinders, really. I couldn't agree. So more. that's the, that's the first thing about shooting in the morning, really, is it just allows a little bit of, you know, slow down the rest of it, and then. The light is special. Uh, if it's windy, it's usually a bit less wind in the morning. Um, if it's busy, it's a bit quieter in the morning. I, I just, I just love that thought of coming home at seven a.m. And, and and knowing that you've got it in the, you know, you've, you've done a day's work. You've got it in the can. You know, you. Uh, that's why I start early. But um, when I started in Afghanistan, which was the first place I ever really started shooting, very early mornings and sunsets and sunrises, it's because the the sunrise and the sunset really more than anything else is a metaphor it's a metaphor about the history you know these histories in painting i don't look at a lot of photography i said but i do look at a lot of paintings and art particularly unfashionable art and the, the first painters that ever painted landscape were in the 17th century french and italian painters like claude lorraine and uh, nicolas poussin and and they always painted these landscapes in golden sunrises and sunsets you look at any of these paintings in the National Gallery, they're always like a, a landscape that looks like somewhere in Italy. There's always the ruins of some great classical temple in the undergrowth disappearing into the ivory. There's always a shepherd boy somewhere on the, walking across a bridge. And there's always a golden light crashing across these pictures from one side or the other. And in those pictures, that golden light is a metaphor. What it's saying is, is this the dawn of a great new era or is this the twilight of its final days? Because they will both look the same, right? The greatest empire that ever existed on Earth before the British came along, the greatest empire that ever existed, and now look, it is nothing more than ruins in the undergrowth. Nothing that men makes can last. Everything passes away. Nothing is permanent. You may think that your job setting up a trading company to trade with the Indies or joining the army to conquer India or setting up a banking system that allow a shared stock trade, it's trading system to invest in uh, colonies in, 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 in the new world. You may think all of this is busy and is a new thing, but believe me, we've all seen it before. And now look at it. It's nothing more than ruins in the undergrowth. Kingdoms rising, kingdoms falling, bowing nations, plumed wars, catch them in an hour of dreaming, cooking chestnuts on the bars. All of these histories just come and go, come and go. Alexander the Great, the Mongol horde, the British invasion in the 1870s and now the American invasion uh, in Afghanistan. These, these empires just wash across these landscapes like, like, like waves lapping up the beach on, uh, on Hove Beach. One after another, one after another, each leaving a little bit of crap at the high tide line. So that, that idea of these kind of histories washing pasts is very interesting. And the, and the metaphor of the sunrise is, you know, this confusion. Are, are we looking at the dawn of a new world 
or we're looking at the twilight of its final days. The first time I went to Afghanistan, I photographed everything in that twilight because, amazingly and stupidly, I thought the war in Afghanistan was over. Hmm. You know, after 30 years, I thought, you know, the Russian war and then the, the Mujahideen war and the civil wars and now the American invasion. And I thought it was the kind of dawn of a new era. And I had to get pictures of all of these objects quick because they will get tidied up and turned into Holiday Inn and Pizza Hut. Uh, you know, an idiot. I didn't know there was going to be another 20 years of pointless fucking murder and slaughter in Afghanistan and pointless expenditure and pointless waste of prestige and human life. And then when I went to Afghanistan the second time and I did the book I did about the photography of John Burke, the photographer that was there in 1870, 1878, I was much more disappointed and I'd lost that kind of childish naivety. And then I photographed those pictures in the pre-dawn and the post-sunset in that blue light, because for me that blue light is a metaphor about disappointment and disenchantment. Uh, and uh, that's the light that, that you wake up from a dream, you know, the dream is over. Uh, and so I did, uh, the second book I did it all in a kind of bluer light. But for me, those lights, you know, if you're a landscape photographer, the only thing you've got is the light. Mm. And the light has to be an, a, part of the, a part of the storytelling. You don't just look, you, you, you know, you choose the light because it looks cool. Um, it, it's, uh, it's one of the few tools that you've got in the back, really, and you need to uh, employ it. Lamp time of year, time of day is what gives the pictures an effect. It's like what I was saying earlier. I don't really give a damn what the front of the Bank of England looks like. What I want to know is, what do you think about what the Bank of England, what are you trying to tell me about your opinions about the Bank of England? Because that may or may not be interesting. But I mean, the fact that you can take a picture of it, shit, I can just turn on the computer and get a picture of it. I don't care. Mm. This, this recording thing doesn't interest me. I want to know what you feel about it. I'm pleased that you mentioned your work with John Burke, because we are going mm. to talk about that in depth a little bit later on. But I just wanted to journey back slightly. You said something really lovely about uh, learning on a 5.4 film camera and taking one great image a day versus many mediocre images. Do you think that learning on that type of camera where you could only take a handful of images so they had to be great has informed the way that you now work in the digital era? Oh yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I, I shoot all. I mean, I have a big fancy digital camera, you know, Phase One, uh, but uh, I shoot uh, almost nothing on it. Uh, and I even get complained. Uh, I do a lot of work for National Geographic nowadays, and once she, I did an entire job, and I sent, you know, for me, I was smashing it. I sent her three thousand. You have to, you have to submit every frame to National Geographic. Every single frame that you shoot has to be sent in unmanipulated. The raw files have to be submitted. Wow. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Wow. <laughs> the whole lot, everything, including everything the assistant shoots as well. You don't get a chance to do any Photoshop work or correct anything. You send the whole lot as raw on a disc. It's submitted. So I sent her the whole lot, uh, and me at full power was about 3,000 frames for a sort of four-week assignment. And she wrote back and complained. And I said, well, what were you expecting? And she said, oh, well, the other fella sent 90,000 frames. Why? <laughs> <laughs> Why in God's name? Why, well, why, why would you even want to look at 90,000 frames? Why would you want to wade through 90,000 frames of anything? But I mean, like, if you think shooting 90,000 frames, I, I, I don't know, it sounds to me like you don't really know what you want to say. I, 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 I find that completely bizarre. But that, that was their expectation, was that, and that I was kind of underselling them by only sending uh, a few, you know. Funnily enough, I spoke to... Matt Holyoke, who had done a lot of work with the royals, he did the portraits for the Queen and Prince Philip for their 70th, 70th wedding anniversary? Okay. Yes. Um, anyway, the yeah. point being, he said something very similar. He said one of the things that he's learned over time is to actually shoot less and process less because if you put too much through, you just lose perspective and what you're trying to say. And yeah. he said that less is more in that instance. Out of interest, when you're sending raw files to something like National Geographic, how do you feel about sending a raw file that someone else is potentially going to edit? How does that sit with you? 
Oh, oh, they are going to edit. It. They they do the edit entirely themselves. That that's what I mean. So it's yeah. it's it's bored. Uh, it's almost a collaboration. But how do you feel about? Oh, I'm fine that? with that. I mean, I, I sorry, I started my career shooting five four on film, and then I moved to working for American magazines, right? Uh, New York, the New York Times and, and Geographic. And Geographic, they're both of them. They are fanatical about. There's no Photoshop. You don't mess with it. You don't. You know, we're, we're not interested in your filters. Uh, we will crop it if we feel like it. Tell us where you think it should be, but we will make the crop. We will make the edit. We will. Leave and rewrite the captions if we feel like we need to as well so uh that's always been the kind of the the uh the price that you pay for um for the money that you get working for magazines but also for the access that you get from working magazines you know i mean the new york times magazine is seen by about three million people so sticking pictures from afghanistan in there is a great deal more effective than sitting on some stupid gallery wall where almost no one will see them so you know you pay a price you pay a ticket price to for the access to the party I think with these people, and the price is quite high because they obviously they're paying for it, so they control a great deal. Uh, but uh, geographic, uh, it's always been the case. You, no manipulation, which means you, you know, get it right in the bloody camera. Uh, you know, get 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 the color right in camera. I've, I've always been a bit of an, an in-camera snob. I still can't really see the the point of a lot of kind of photoshopping of, of work. Uh, I don't really do it, to be honest. Much, you know, color and tone, color and contrast is about it really. I use graduate filters, old hmm. school. <laughs> I use long exposures and graduate filters and things like that because uh, I think you just get the damn thing right in camera. If you know what you want to say, it's not a problem to get it right in camera because, to be honest, if if you were in a place and you said, look, you know, what I really want is to get this somber effect, you know, the reason why I've come here is this somber effect, then you would just, as you shoot it, you would want to see what it looks like with the darker sky on it, with the graduate filter or whatever it is, mm. because that's the psychological effect that you're trying to create through this picture. You don't just say, oh, I'll shoot it and then two days time when i get the damn thing into lightroom i'll smash the hell out of it with the sliders <laughs> and then i'll finally get it looking like what i want it to look like uh, i want it to look like what i want it to look like before i leave and a lot of places i go to you can't go back to it and a lot of places you know to be honest Matt, a lot of places that not anymore but a lot of places i used to go to seriously fucking dangerous right and i always think if you're in somewhere that's dangerous number one don't be a tourist through other people's horror right there's nothing fucking worse than turn up in Afghanistan because you think you'll win a prize or because it's good for your ego or because you think the chicks will dig it and it'll help you get laid. Only go to Afghanistan. And also, you know, I'm also married and I don't appreciate, particularly these days, uh, terrifying Mrs. Norfolk. Needlessly. Mm. Right. So, um, so, you know, the deal I have with her is, you know, I go, but... It's to do a specific thing, get on with it, do it, be clear about it, and then finish and come home. Don't fucking wander about, you know, through through other people's horror zones or other people's war zones, looking for ideas or hoping for inspiration or uh, trying to get your, uh, you know, if I hang around long enough, maybe somebody will commission me. Uh, that's not a nice way for her to pass time. Me, weeks on end in Afghanistan, messing about, you know, the longer you're there, the more chance there is of getting killed in a car bomb or something. So, uh, you know, when I go, I go, it's pretty swift. It, I do what I need to do and then I come home. And that's the deal that I have with her. And I think anything else is uh, unreasonable. Exactly what you've just said then is one of the wonderful things about doing this podcast is that sometimes they, the photography takes a back seat and it transcends beyond photography because... As you said then, family and the people that we love are, are far more important. There's something I wanted to touch on. If I've done my homework right, you were you were born in Lagos, Nigeria, 1963. Yeah. And you, yes, I am the British Empire. You are. Uh, educated in here, in England, finishing at Oxford and Bristol. You gained a, a degree in philosophy and sociology, but then you took a course in photography. And I saw a video from the University of Wales where you said the best things you learnt during that photography course were to toughen up, conquer your shyness and learn, and this is what stuck out for me, learn how to persuade people to let them into, to let you into their lives. And I spoke to Peter Dench last week and he said that is the one thing that has, has helped him in his career is being able to persuade people to let you in. Uh. Is well, I've got to say, Peter Dench is much better than me. <laughs> he's he, he's a he's a genius at it. He's an absolute yeah, genius. Yeah, I think but some of those photographers that are, um, are, are great at that kind of work, they are also charmers. I remember meeting uh, Philip Jones Griffiths once, 
you know, like in a field in the middle of nowhere somewhere, mm. you know. And within about three minutes, I just thought, what a lovely man. And also, not just that what a lovely man, but also that you could sit him down next to a duchess at a dinner and she would fall in love with him. Mm-hmm. But you could also sit him down in a coal miner's house for fish and chips and they would like him as well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It was, it, he, he, he was, uh, uh, not everyone can move through things like that, you know? Um, and I think those, those photographers that are very good at that, those kind of social situations and those kind of personal relationships and things are those people that are kind of quite charming. I'm not charming, believe me. <laughs> no one's ever going to give me a charm award. But, um, uh, I think that, that, that having to do that at, uh, at Newport was, uh, was a real skill. Not, not just about, you know, kind of coming to your house, but I just, you know, and that is a magical thing about photography. You know, this this kind of camera around your neck. I think Tom Stoddart was saying the same thing. Because you? you've got this thing around your neck, you can just like you know knock on the door. Can I come in your house? Can I see? Can you tell me what you're doing? What's that lady? You know, can I tell? Can you tell me what happened to your life? Where did you get that food from? What do you think of the war? What do you think of the politics? And people will tell you. You know, just because you've got this, uh, you know, this thing around your neck. And I think that's absolutely the you know marvelous kind of gift that is photography. You know, it's the right to be a nosy sod into other people lives uh and even as a landscape photographer i'm, I'm amazed that you, you still have to do that a lot because you need you know access into things or you know where you're going at one o'clock you know two o'clock in the morning people want to stop you and ask you and talk to you and you've got to be able to tell them what it is you're doing and make them like you enough that they'll let you on the roof so you can take a picture and stuff so uh, having some ability to um well i don't have any charm but i have a kind of rat-like cunning i would say <laughs> <laughs> Well, that, that's uh, I, think, I, was... I think I learned that even more through working for newspapers at the very beginning of my career. Well, that's what I was going to ask you. If you and I, I disagree. I think I think you are. <laughs> I think you are charming. But no, don't let me any if... money, Matt. <laughs> but if you don't think you're charming, that was going to be my question. What techniques have you developed over the years? If it's not your natural instinct to be that way, what do I, I used to see this when I was at the developed? Telegraph. When I was at the Telegraph, I used to do portraits of the Daily Telegraph as a features page when I really first started. And there were some photographers there that were, and there's a guy called Andy Hamilton Lane that was, you know, he was a charmer. He was a, he was a pretty boy. He would, he would come back from a job and, uh, you know, he'd been out for dinner with the, 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 you know, with the girl. Yeah, maybe, maybe he was like sort of had a phone number and he was going to see her next week and the rest of it. And me, the me, the way I dealt with those portraits was I had a really clear idea before I even arrived. I had some little trick in a flash gun or something in my camera bag. I was going to do this thing with a ring flash and two flashes from the side. As soon as I walk in the room, I scan it for a good shape. I've got some good graphics. And then it's just like, back you up. Get there. Get there. Boff, 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 boff. Okay, I'm finished now. Uh, and often you'd only get 10 minutes to do these things anyway, you know, mm. one hour slot, 50 minutes for the writer, 10 minutes for the photographer. And you have to produce two different pictures for the paper. So uh, you'd have to walk in with the idea very clear in your head. And so my 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 technique was always to uh, have some little kind of trick that will work, uh, some little kind of gimmicky thing that hasn't let me down before. And I can always like roll it out again. Be, you know, uh, So that's how I would do those things. And I, and I, w- I would just kind of kind of push people around a little bit mm. to get what I wanted. Whereas Andy Lane, he used to charm people. He'd be there for hours. Uh, and uh, he was a, it was a completely different technique. My friend Tony Olmos, who works at The Observer, is a really lovely guy. And when he goes around to people's houses to take portraits of them, he ends up staying for dinner, and then they, you know, he's still friends with them years later. Me, I get a good picture in 10 minutes, but I, it's more through a little bit of kind of if you do what I say, this whole thing will finish much faster. Do this, do that, look this way, look left, look right, look in the camera, thank you, goodbye. It's over. So interestingly, with your approach, what did that offer the viewer that was different to someone oh, that had maybe well, come in on a charm offensive and, and shot slightly different? Uh, oh, well, you know, I was never a very good portrait photographer. Mm. That's, that's, not, that's not a good method to become a great portrait photographer. It's, it, you get an adequate portrait out of it. And for newspapers where you really have five minutes in a, in a hotel suite, you know, with a, I did a lot of film directors, stage, stage actors and stuff like that, you know, and they'd be hyping a, they're hyping a play and they book two suites in a hotel somewhere and they're in one room, you know, next, they're in next door with the Sunday Times. They've got an hour, 50 minutes for the journo, 10 minutes photographer, and then they will be led in by the PR into this room. The journal will ask them questions for 50 minutes while you, you'll try and work out where you're going to do the picture. 
Uh, and then when you finish, they will be taken next door and they'll do the same thing again for the Observer or the Daily Mail or whatever it is, you know. Mm. Uh, and they'll just be doing that for an entire day and then that's their publicity done for a film or for a stage play or for a book that's coming out or something like that. You know, it, it's just a machine. So the only thing it really offered to the newspapers was a, a you know, grin and grab, cheap and cheerful. What, what my pitchers used to call uh, flash for cash. <laughs> and and I, was, I was I was okay. I mean, newspaper, new papers. It was good enough for newspapers, you know. I think the secret of being a newspaper photographer is I was uh, I wasn't the greatest photographer in the world, but I was I was very reliable. You know, what, you know she's, if you think of the picture, she's got forty pages. She's got to fill each. You know, she's got to shoot forty six pictures. She wants to make forty six phone calls and then forget about it. So reliable in what sense? What would you? Professional and you know the picture. It won't be the greatest picture ever. Straight. It's not going to be Nadav Kanda when it comes in, but it'll be good enough. It won't be rubbish. Um, it, you know, it will be. Um, I don't forget that you you're meant to photograph the dog as well. Uh, you know, uh, because it's uh, the stories about the dog. Uh, I'm polite. I turn up on time. Uh, the dog doesn't eat my homework, uh, uh, and it's done. And you know, and she and she's made 46 phone calls, set up 46 pictures, and now she can get on with the next thing that she's got to do. Not think, oh God, I wonder if I need to send a roll of film over because Simon sometimes turns up with no film. Oh, I wonder, oh, when will it come in? Uh, oh, I better phone again and make sure that it's the job. Uh, does he know it's Tuesday? I better ring. You know, no picture editor wants to do that on a on a busy newspaper picture desk. They want to just make one phone call and know that the picture will arrive day after tomorrow. It's interesting. There's been common themes when I've been having these conversations and Ian Gavin said something very similar. He said, you've got to do the basics. You've got to yeah. do the basics well, particularly when, as you've just said then, his his photographs, the way he described it, he said they're a tool for someone else to do their job. And yeah. they put their trust in me to deliver what they need so they can do their job. And it's exactly what you're saying now. It's it, almost yeah. the picture doesn't matter almost. I'm not saying you can produce an awful picture, but you've got to do the basics. Yeah, then I mean, none of them are prize-winning pictures, but they were all fine. Mm. Uh, and uh, I did about three years of that after I left college. It was in my kind of like apprenticeship in the real world. Was you know I kind of bashed those out, you know, one a day pretty much every day for three or four years for the telegraphs, the features pages of the Telegraph and the features pages of the Sunday Telegraph, and nothing special. No one will remember any of them. <laughs> Well, in that case, let's move on, because this takes us on quite nicely, actually. So, wait, sorry, the, the, the move on the, the, is, is part of it, really. Because I was doing all of this, the, the sort of seg between this and the next thing, that, the next projects that I did, that my first books that I started doing, was because this work for The Telegraph was completely soulless. I didn't really care about it very much, but it was quite well paid, and I was living in London. I was having a lot of fun, that's for sure. And um, But I was particularly obsessed about uh, the Holocaust and about genocide and about landscape and trying to use it as a tool for photographing these. Uh, and I just began the first book that I ever did, uh, which is called For Most of It I Have No Words, but it was a, a project that was done almost in secret from my clients. Mm. You know, I would, just, I would just wait until I had two grand in the bank. Two grand was my target level. I would work, 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 and then when I had two grand spare, I was living in a bedsit above a Turkish restaurant, so life was cheap. I'd work, 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 two grand, and then two grand was enough money for me to go to Poland and do a shoot, or enough money for me to go to Dresden and do a shoot. Mm. And then I'd come back completely skinned, and I'd phone up the teller and go, oh, Sasha, I'm back, can I have a job? And she'd say, oh, yeah, we need a picture of a house with a property page, it's 160 quid, but the, you'd make more money out of the petrol mileage than you would out of the fee. And I never really told them anything about what I was doing. And, this, and it was important to me that the... For the newspapers, I was doing wide angle lenses, color film, flash, lit stuff, portraiture with tricksy lighting. And for the project I did for myself, it was the utter opposite of that. It was stillness. It was square format. It was black and white, fine printing. I'm a, I'm a super duper black and white printer, or I was in my day. Super fine printing, calmness. It was about history. It was about research. It was about these landscapes that experienced genocide and this kind of atmosphere and ghosts across these landscapes, tiny little markers that told you about these horrific histories. Uh, and it was the absolute opposite of the kind of wide-angled, in-your-face, flash color film stuff that I was doing for newspapers. And it was kind of, it was kind of invented as a kind of antidote, to be honest. Uh, because the the uh, the newspaper work, although it paid very well uh, at the time, doesn't anymore, but it paid very well at the time. Uh, it left me incredibly empty, and uh, and and it, uh, and I, I longed for, for to say something a bit more in, in, interesting. That was actually 
when when we were going to come on to talk about books, that was going to be one of my questions. Was was things like books and your own projects always part of the plan, or was it born out of doing work whilst it taught you things about the job, didn't necessarily inspire you? No, it was a kind of plan. It was always like a fully hatched plan. It was always a fully hatched plan. It was going to be a book. It had a certain shape, even from the very beginning. It was. It had this kind of downwards curve. The pictures were going to start quite photojournalistic and get quieter and quieter, and then end as, a, as a, almost as a series of kind of abstracts. And in that way, the picture, the book, the book itself is a metaphor about the sort of falling curve of forgetting, because the book was about genocide and the forgetting of genocide and the remembering of genocide, but probably the forgetting of genocide. So I wanted the pictures to, the pictures at the beginning of the book would all be very horrible pictures of dead bodies. The pictures in the middle of the book would be of barbed wire and prison camps, and the pictures towards the end of the book would be so quiet, there would be almost nothing in them whatsoever. And that was memory fading away. That was that entropic, entropic decay of memory as it falls away with time. So the sort of shape of the book, what was going to be in it was always there. Uh, for me, I have always had a big kind of master plan. And photography is not something I know a lot of people like to go out and create pictures. But for me, going out with a camera is a kind of gathering in process. The pictures, already, it's already in my head. I already know almost all of what it's going to look like. Hmm. And when I go out, it's just, it's just, I've just got to go and collect it. So and you... for me, that having that, that kind of rigid pre-shoot thing is a way for me to get freedom because if i know what it's going to look like and then when i get there there's a you know a fire or the, you know, the sun's coming from a, well the, you know the, the the something else is going on or the, there's something i didn't know about is happening or uh, somebody says something and it, it triggers an idea then because i've got my rigids my skeleton then i can have all that soft stuff uh, around it the 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 flexible stuff the 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 battered about by circumstances stuff it allows me to make a good picture in a short time and i find that a better way of working rather than oh i'll just go and see what happens have a plan have a clear idea what you want to talk about even have an idea of what the pictures may look like if you have to bend the idea and go for another one that's even better because something takes you in a different direction that's good but start out with something solid if you've got something underneath you, you can push off that into into the clouds. But if you turn up with just bloody clouds, then you'll just fall out of the sky. Hmm. And that's always been my method. Uh, and I I pre-shoot them all. They're all in my head. And it's just uh, it's like gathering in kittens. You just have to go out and get them. They're wayward and they're naughty and they'll run up in different directions. And it's going to be quite hard to gather them, but it's just a gathering in. So in order to... How will you how will you start to collect those pictures in your head? Is it through? Uh, oh, do you, do a you lot? should is, see my you should see my notebooks in Afghanistan. So that's it, what I mean. Is, my, it, is it is it notes? Is it research? Is it is it speaking to people? Everything, uh, all of those, and you know you you add to it while you're there as well. You add to it while you're there. But in 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 somewhere like Afghanistan or Iraq or Bosnia, the middle of the day is just for looking. You know, if I've decided that the beginning light and the end light is, is the metaphor that I need over the pictures, then the beginning of the, the middle of the day is just for gathering information. It's just for like research, intel. You just go around, talk to people, look at stuff, go on journeys to look at a thing. When you get to a thing, you take out a compass, amazing piece of kit, a compass. It's surprised how many photographers don't know it. Uh, you take out a compass. It tells you where the sun is going to rise. Is it going to come from this side? Or is it going to come from there? Is it going to, so do I need to be, so I need to be back in one. I need to be back here in the evening. I need to come back in winter time when there's snow on the ground. I need to come back when there's no leaves on that tree because I want to see what's behind that tree. So, and then in Afghanistan, I marked out these I had pages in a notebook, and it was like these are my 4 a.m. pictures. These are my 5 a.m. pictures if it's cloudy. These are my 5 a.m. pictures if it's sunshiny. Uh, these are my 7 in the evening pictures. These are my 7:30 pictures. Uh, these are pictures indoors or under soft light or don't need light so that I can do these in the middle of the day because I can do this any time. I'm not going to waste a morning doing an indoor picture. I can do that any time. I would start a diary and I would mark in the diary which of those pictures I would be doing at 5 a.m., at 7 a.m., at 6 o'clock in the afternoon mm. and at 7 p.m. in the afternoon. They would all be marked up in the diary and then we just go. And then it's just a question of organizing a diary so that we would just go off to the west of the city and we do all those ones on the west at the same time. Uh, and it just allows me to be very, very methodical. But that first book that I did in Afghanistan, uh, I think there's 47 pictures in the book. I only shot 240 sheets. The entire shoot is 240 frames, right? 
So that, that, that's right. You, you, you know, that's when you know what you want, you just go and get it, right? It's 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 fairly precise. When you get there, maybe someone's you know set fire to the building. It's burning. Wow, amazing! I wasn't expecting this. This is great. Okay, well I know where I'm going to stand. I know my angle. I know that I need to have the front of the building and the American spy base behind it, whatever. So I know where I want to be, and now I can concentrate on the burning. Right. So that you can take serendipity into account, but it, if you've got the structure. Serendipity for me is much more uh, gearable. Uh, uh, what do you call it? Um, you can leverage that serendipity if you've got structure. But if you're just wandering around in the car and going, oh, you know, what should I photograph? Uh, what should I do? Why am I here? Uh, who should I talk to? Mm-hmm. You're just going to waste days and days on end. Uh, so um, I think my my Afghanistan book came out of about probably about forty or fifty days on the ground in Afghanistan. And the entire shoot is 246 sheets of film. Again, it's, you know, it started it's back to what I was saying at the beginning of our conversation. It's starting with why. If you've got a why, and you know what you want to say. As you said, then it makes it a lot easier to go and collect what you want. And actually, it's probably just a good metaphor, not just for photography. It's like these conversations. I, I do a lot of research. I do a lot of homework because I have a structure which yeah. it doesn't mean exactly. I will stick to that structure, but what it does give me is the freedom to then go off and explore other exactly. areas of conversation. Exactly. Which, but if you but if I'm you talk to young if you talk to a young photographer and say, "Don't get your camera out until I've seen all your research and you've made a thing," they will crap themselves. Yeah. Oh my God, you are cutting off my creativity. Oh my God, uh, what? How can I? How can I make wonderful pictures if I'm uh, tram you know in tram lines? No, that is how you make great. Yeah. creative stuff by having some sort of guiding uh, tracks and, and fencing around your project otherwise you're just running around like a damn fool shooting random rubbish that i shot on the streets of damascus and that's a book well then that's fine it's probably not a very good book peter dench again to mention the wonderful man said something very similar with his, his project he said i like to give myself very narrow parameters his project uh Along the A1, for example, he said, I chose the A1 because it gave me a very narrow parameter, which I could explore either side of it, but ultimately I had a goal and I knew what I wanted to achieve and I did it. And he said, yeah. by having less options, I had more freedom and more creativity. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, I'm afraid a lot of young photographers over-interpret that thing. Peter's got it exactly right. A lot of young photographers that I meet, you know, college students, stuff, they, they, they just create too much they say oh I, I, i'm only going to take pictures when i'm standing on one leg on a thursday <laughs> you're like no that is not helpful <laughs> that is that is too much restriction <laughs> you know all lots of good stuff is going to pass you by and it won't be thursday and so you won't be able to shoot it you know don't 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 make it too too small <laughs> yeah yeah uh, but, but yeah you know a1 it's 300 miles long right it's not you know he's made a restriction it's actually not a restriction at all. No, There's not at all. Hundreds of miles of road to photograph, mm-hmm. right? And he is free to go anywhere he wants on there and make great pictures, and he does. Yeah, I think I think restriction is probably the wrong word that I used. I think stru- no, no, I mean, stru- structure good. is the right word. I yeah, think. structure, or tram lines, fencing around the outside of a thing, you know, perimeter or something like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Do you remember when? Because we've talked about your first book in. Afghanistan. And when I was doing my research, I've, I've spoken to a lot of wonderful photographers, none of which have had quite the the Google presence that you have. It took, and I'm not kidding, it took to page 14, where I finally got to something that wasn't Simon Norfolk, it was Visit Norfolk. Oh, I... <laughs> do, do, do you... Visit, um, visit a bloke called Simon in Norfolk. <laughs> uh, it, it, was, it was literally Visit Norfolk. But it was page 14. And, you know, I've spoken to Art Wolf, prolific photographer, that he didn't have that much that much of a presence and i it got me thinking do you remember when your work first started to gain traction and become noticed because you clearly work extremely hard do you remember oh, not, when it... not anymore i'm extremely lazy nowadays uh when i came back from afghanistan and um uh dowie said that you know almost immediately said that he would publish what i've got and then I got it published in the New York Times magazine, who I'd never worked for before. So that was a huge step up in my editorial work. Um, and I got approached by galleries for print sales. So it was that that was the kind of step change in my career, mm. like like nothing else really. When it comes to like you know Google search, I mean certainly Instagram. My my Instagram's nuts, but I have no idea why. 
you know, I mean, I follow professional cycling. My Instagram is like 10 times the size of the Instagram of some of the professional cyclists that I follow. Hmm. I mean, I mean, those guys are like celebrities. Yeah, they've got like sponsorship deals and stuff, you know. <laughs> um, they're on the telly. <laughs> but I don't, I don't know why, you know. And we, we spend a lot of time trying to work out who the hell is what, looking at my pictures on Instagram, but I have no idea who they are. But there's 165,000 of them. But do you not think it's because of... You're, you're so curious, it's what you were saying at the start. It's not just about photography for you, It's there's a far deeper meaning. And that book I was reading from Simon Sinek, he said, people don't follow what you do, they follow why you do it. Well, yeah, I mean, that's true. And, and the way Instagram interprets that is that they follow, you know, people that have... If you have a kind of goofy lifestyle or something... You know, if you're if you're on a, a yacht traveling across the Pacific, then you know you can be certainly Patreon. So there seems to be uh, a thing where you can vicariously pay to live other people's lifestyles because they're having a more interesting lifestyle than you. Um, I. What was the question? I, I'm not even sure it was a question. Oh, it was okay. just we were we were kind of musing about yeah, why I don't, your Instagram I don't, I don't is so large. I don't know why the people follow but... me. I don't, I don't know what it's about. Uh, uh, we, we, when I started Instagram, it, I was very much uh, pushed into it against my will. It was clear that a uh, geographic that it wasn't the case anymore of, you know, do you want to do Instagram or not? It's if you do not have an Instagram presence, you will not be considered for this assignment. A, a geographic, the way it works is the, a, a picture editor uh, will assemble a package of an idea. OK, so we're going to do a story about Mayan temples. I suggest we have this writer. I suggest we publish it on this date because that's a good anniversary of this. I said we will have an exhibition. We will have a book that goes with it. Uh, we will have. Uh, and I also think we should have this photographer and we'll have this on Snapchat. This will be on Instagram. This will be our TikTok presence. Uh, uh, and this is the photographer that will do all that. And then they upsell that to the editorial committee. Mm. So that means they have to co collect, kind of compile a package with you as the sort of part of the package. Uh, and she phoned me once and she said, uh, what's your social media offer? And I went, Poof, social media, I don't do it. Molly, it's crap. And she went, oh, the other guy has 100,000 followers on Instagram. You're not going to get this job. Uh, and it's actually not an option anymore to not have it. Wow. I hadn't realized that the... Oh, no, the this is absolutely the way it is. You, you need to look at things like... I get I get emails from model agencies, for example. Uh, what's that model agency called? Um, Wild London Models. Yes. And if you look at them, if you look at their webpage, the models are ranked by their Instagram following because you are meant to be the, the, the person in the picture and also the means of delivery of the picture. So do you think for... By, by putting it on your Instagram, you are delivering it to 100,000 people who are already interested in the clothes and fashion and the rest of it anyway. So if you don't have 200,000 followers, you are not a serious model in the modeling business. It's almost what you're buying when you buy the, when you buy the model. You're buying access to their Instagram platform. Of course. So for something like National Geographic, where they're looking at you and another photographer, for example, is it... I'm trying to work out for them, is it a... Is it a prestige thing to say we have this photographer and and the number of followers represents? No, not his prestige. Profile, it's like when the, it... when, the, when the article comes out, we know that four hundred thousand people will know the articles out because we will write a, uh, a series of five running uh, Instagram postings that will run up to the public to the publication date, so that the world knows that this article is out, and we will be employing their Instagram feed as well as our own Instagram. Well, feed. that was what I was going to say. Are they are they not hijacking, but are they they're almost buying what you said? They're buying your audience as well. Yes. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, and uh, it's not a crude thing. Oh, he's got two hundred thousand. You've got hundred ninety. So no, he gets it. You, you know, she gets it. You don't. But it will get seriously weighed in the pod. And uh, I didn't want to do Twitter because it's for twats, and I didn't want to do Facebook. So we just said, well, look, we'll just do Instagram, but we'll do it properly, and we'll get a proper thing. We'll work really hard at it. Uh, Jamie, who works with me, uh, he's the he's the Instagram meister. Um, he writes the captions. Uh, and we always said the captions are not going to be, I've just had a piece of toast. The captions are going to be something really interesting about the history of this place or about an anniversary or uh, about uh, some great event or something like that. You know, some kind of, you, I want you to read the text and go, oh, I didn't know that. That's great. 
I'm not just sticking up a picture of a bloody waterfall or that sodden beach in Iceland that's got the ice on it. <laughs> 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 all right. Uh, you know, the, we put up pictures. I don't put up anything that I've shot today. I, it's always stuff from my archive. And Jamie does a ton of research. And the captions, I mean, Jamie's captions are fantastic. He writes these great, in, interesting pieces of history that go down the side of things. And I think together they work really brilliantly. Uh, but it's not, uh, you know, this is what I've done today, or this uh, I just had a piece of toast, or that kind of trivial stuff. Mine's quite kind of heavyweight, which is against all the rules of Instagram, and it's not what you're meant to do, but it seems to work. I mean, you say it's against the rules, but I, because I've noticed, and you mentioned Nadav Kander earlier, Nadav does something very similar with his Instagram. There is always a very clear description, yeah. and a very detailed and lengthy description, and and I, I personally read it, and I'm sure his hundred thousand followers do because it's something is working. So, out of interest, how I can't believe we've got onto Instagram here, but how often will you, how often will you post on Instagram? Oh, well, I've kind of uh, stopped, uh, but uh, uh, I've kind of cut it down to almost nothing at the moment. But yeah. um, only only twice a week. Right. Two a week. Not not a frantic kind of uh, thing. Jamie is also fantastically well organized, and he's got a spreadsheet where he's gone through and found a whole load of anniversaries and interesting dates and stuff. And he, it goes out for about a year in advance. And he knows that in, on you know November the 3rd, he'll be posting a picture that I did in a nuclear laboratory because it is the 70th anniversary of the dropping of a nuclear weapon on the X. A test of a nuclear weapon was 80 years ago today, and he's got them all on a spreadsheet going out about a year in advance. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, that's, that's kind of how we do it. You know, the, the, they're, they're very much in the archive. You're not meant to do that, history. I mean, you're meant to, sh you know, post pictures that you shot today off your mobile phone. I don't think I've ever done that. While we're on the subject of writing, it is something that I wanted to come on and talk about because when I was looking at your website, again, you are very, you're clearly a very talented writer. You're very good at it. It is yeah. it's interesting. Yes, you are. It's clear. It is. It's informative. It's interesting. The yeah. writing that you do, and it's not just. We're not talking a small caption. It is a very detailed description of the circumstances that that photograph was taken, and the, in some cases, the circumstances, the history lessons that led to that situation. Is that something that you've always done? I guess you kind of answered this at the start, really, because it's more than photography for you. But has the writing always been as important as the images that you? Uh, not the writing. I've got to say, I hate writing. And uh, those captions that you've seen, that anything I've written, it takes me weeks to write mm. a hundred a hundred word caption because uh, it's a horrible experience. Uh, I, yeah, I don't I don't enjoy the process of writing very much. But I I, I do like the idea of uh, gathering the uh, ideas and influences. And if you uh, it comes, if anybody comes to my you know the classes that I give or uh, lectures that I do. I don't, I don't think it's very interesting for a photographer like me to stand up in front of a lecture audience and say, I've been to the North Pole and I've been to Peru and, I, and here's my pictures from Wagadougou and here's my pictures from Timbuktu. It's mm -hmm. not interesting. Uh, when I do a lecture, it's about these are the reasons why I made this picture look like this. It's because of this painting or it's because of that sculpture or it's because of this idea from philosophy from the 14th century or it's because of this trend in, you know, landscape design of the English country garden from the 1760s to the 1820s informed uh, this all. Uh, and it's um, usually something from the kind of history of art is, is where I go for most of these kind of ideas. Mm -hmm. So, you know, explaining that kind of, um, what do you call it? They're not influences because the pictures don't look like that, uh, but it's it's uh, it's its pedigree, the pedigree of the idea. Uh, I think that's interesting. So when I when I write, it's just mostly usually about the pedigree of the idea. Where did what was what was the germ of this, and what were the things that that kind of watered the plant uh, that created the picture? What were the nutrients? What were the how much sunlight did it get? Where did it come from? And that's why. This picture looks like that. That's why it looks like a Claude Lorraine painting. That's why it looks like a Frederick Evans photograph from 1910. That's why it looks like Michelangelo's Pietà. Those, those are the things that I'm trying to riff off mm. uh, and quote, really. I mean, they're, they're sort of like uh, quotations. You know, for me, I'm, I'm quoting from Claude Lorraine or I'm quoting from a sculpture that I saw or I'm quoting from a Neolithic cave painting. You also have... Um, can I just correct myself? There yeah, are no Neolithic cave paintings. It's a Paleolithic cave painting. That's a <laughs> terrible error to make. 
<laughs> there are no Neolithic cave paintings. Even an idiot knows that. What am I talking about? Late Paleolithic. Excellent uh, save. My current, my current favourite subject is the Late Paleolithic. What I, uh, I forgot what I was going to say now. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, <laughs> Gobsmacked. <laughs> yes, I was. No, actually, what I was going to say is that you... You have a very rare ability, which a lot of the photographers I've spoken to have a very similar thing. We've talked about him a lot, but Peter Dench is exactly the same. You have a rare ability. Whilst everyone else is looking in one direction, you are looking in the complete opposite direction. Oh, yes. Yes. When they go zag, you go zig. Exactly. Uh, when I was, when I went, the first time I went to Afghanistan, someone told me there was 300 photographers in town. And I remember thinking, how the hell? I mean, I can't compete with that. Mm. Uh, and I remember I had I had my 35 millimeter stuff packed in a in a bag, and I had the 5.4 camera, and I was waiting for the sort of you know to get the bus to the airport, and then my last decision was like sod it, leave it at home, leave the 35 mil at home, because if I take that, I'll try and take pictures which are good on that, and then I'll just be on the same platform as everybody else. What I'll do is I'll take the 5.4, and then it's death or glory. Hmm. All right, It'll either completely fail. Or it'll be possibly interesting. But if I do the 35 mil thing, I'm never going to be able to compete against all those other photographers. Uh, I remember going out at 4 o'clock in the morning and coming back and passing them on the way down to... They were going down to breakfast, and I was coming in after three hours of shooting. <laughs> and I remember one said to me, we never see you taking pictures. <laughs> Is that good? <laughs> Fine. <laughs> you do what you like, but uh, this this kind of works for me. But uh, at least if you're doing something different, then there's a chance that somebody will be interested in it. And if you're just going to try and compete with everyone else, then either you're going to have to be bloody brilliant or very, very lucky or, or, or something, you know. And uh, I just couldn't see how I could ever show my head above all of that uh, talent that was, you know, the best photographers in the world were in Kabul. Uh, well, uh, in Afghanistan. You know, during the American invasion, and how was I going to outdo them? You know, and how was I going to get it back there fast enough? And how was I going to, you know, get the magazines to be interested in it when they've already got someone there? You know, I'm just never going to do that. So I thought, okay, sod it. I'll just take the five four. Either I make it work, or I just come down with my tail between my legs, and no one will even know that I went. And that was very much the plan. Shit or bust. <laughs> So was that something, because my, my example here was, which we'll come on to talk about in a second, is Blue Jean. Uh, the, oh, the computers? Yeah, the computers. Oh, yes. Yeah. Th that was where my logic was, but, and we'll come on to what that is in a minute. But, so that technique of looking in the complete opposite direction, is that something that oh, you well, That's a great example, right? Because I remember I went to the French uh, computer designing and um, moderating Amer uh, France's nuclear weapons. And the director of the of the computer came with me in the morning, you know, and was chatting for an hour or so. And then we went for lunch. He took me for lunch in the canteen. Uh, and then afterwards, he said, uh, OK, well, we need to go back and do some more pictures, you know. And I said to him, um, it, I'm very flattered and everything, but haven't you got other stuff to do? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, he said, no, I am really enjoying this. Because when I look at the computer, I think, is the interconnectivity between the hard drives and the databasing working? Is the functionality of the FIFO FIFO buffers uploading through to the data modulators? I'm looking for a series of functionalities in the computer. And then he said, and when you open the cupboard, you go, oh, purple cables with orange cables. Great. And he said, no one else does that. <laughs> There's loads of green lights, but then there's some red ones as well. And I get all excited. And he says, we've never had anyone do that before. Well, while we're here, actually, because, and again, so the, the point I'm trying to get to here is is that you, it's your ability to look in the opposite direction. And, and this work that you did with Blue Jean is looking in the complete opposite direction than any other photographer is, or certainly any photographer that I've seen is exploring about war photography. So firstly, would you mind ex explaining what that project is? Well, it was about supercomputers, and it was. Uh, I, fa I found that there's. Um, whilst it's sometimes uh, impossible to find out the actual, uh, you know, some places didn't even want to tell me where their supercomputers were because a lot of them are involved in weapons design, um, and a lot of the 
Googles and Hotmails, and, and this is a long time ago, so Hotmail and things like that, you know, they were in sort of semi-secret locations, you know, mm. fortified locations. I was amazed that some of the buildings had more fortifications than some military bases that I've been to. Um, so there, whilst it was almost impossible to find out uh, from the PR people what was going on with their supercomputers, that in, in their own little community, it's quite competitive as to who has the biggest supercomputer. Um, you know, how many petaflops, giga petaflops, I think it's, it used to be petaflops, it's probably the one above petaflops now. Um, you know, calculations per millisecond. Um, so, um, so you could find this list, you know. And if you phoned the PR people, I remember phoning Edinburgh University, and she said, how do you even know we have a supercomputer? Who told you? <laughs> Uh, and then I phoned, uh, I got the number of the fellow that installed the FIFO, FIFO buffers and the internet gutter and the Dido, Dido, over branch, you know, arc. And I said, can I come and photograph? And he was like, great, we'd love to. We know, because I run this computer, I know damn well that you can't expose any of its secrets by looking at it. Mm. Right? Now, if you try and plug your mobile phone into it, <laughs> or connect a laptop to it, or slide a USB stick into a socket somewhere, yeah, you're a Russian spy and we'll shoot you before you get out of the building, right? But by looking at it, you can learn nothing about it. Uh, and so they have no problem. If I, I went, to, I went to the geeks, and the geeks went, "Of course you can come and photograph it. We'd be very happy. We, we don't. We never have it photographed. We're very proud of our machine, and we know full well that you can't." know it's it's you know know its soul or know the clever code that we've written by looking at it and in fact in one of many of the places i went to you had to leave that's another good thing about you shooting on five four is uh, you had to leave everything electronic outside because the assumption is that you're trying to communicate with the computer and suck code off the computer ah i see so you, you couldn't even take a mobile phone in the buildings um so um uh, and what interested me was not, you know, that it does 9,000 petaflops or whatever, or that it's got a FIFO FIFO buffer, but that it was a kind of, um, that they had a kind of um, spooky, godlike omniscience. Uh, and they had a kind of um, uh, immaterial, unknowable intelligence that was... Um, yeah, yeah, well, uh, kind of the ghost in the machine was what interests me. Uh, and some of the very big computers, the uh, they're in uh, quite amazing spaces. If you're going to build a, you know, the biggest computer in the world. You're going to build a very, very fancy hall with very, very fancy power interruption systems and air conditioning systems and cabling systems and the internet connectivity systems and all of that stuff around it and then a security system around that with security guards and you know watchtowers around barbed wire around the outside of it the whole thing is going to start to resemble uh, a prison camp for data uh, or, a, or a military base for data you know mm. uh, and a lot of the <clears throat> And it was all part of my research about, you know, when I went to Afghanistan, I could see what the consequences of weaponry was on the landscape. That was the main thing I was photographing. This is what a fuel air bomb does. This is what a 1,000 pound paveway bomb does. This is what a Kalashnikov does. If you just shoot at a building for 10 years in a civil war, it will look like this. If you drop a 1,000 pound bomb, on the contrary, it will look completely different. Uh, and after a few years of that, I was much more interested in, well, what does the, the place where they made this bomb look like? I've seen what the bomb does, but where's the rest of the brains involved? Mm. Let's go and see, you know, let's see photographing the factories where it's done, or even the, 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 the computers that are spending their time designing America's next generation of nuclear weapons, or designing the trailing edge of a wing of a jet fighter so that it can go through air faster without burning up, or fa uh, without making noise, or, something, or without a radar trace, or designing the nose cone of a missile so that it can travel through radar jamming systems and stuff like that. Uh, and it seemed to me that the, it was the kind of... Um, dark genius behind instead of just photographing consequence 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 let's photograph process 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 you know the dark genius that designed the weapon mm. that blew up the moss that killed the children uh, and it was about sort of going backwards and up through the through the process of a weapons delivery you know the pilot who lets go of the bomb in an airplane is the last person in the sequence isn't it yeah, uh, and, and I read this fact in America about how fifty percent of every uh, of all mass graduates in America are working on cryptography systems, 
which is mostly to do with you know military communications of one sort or another, either financial or military communications. So, you know, it seems to me that that was this amazing answer to you know where is the cure for cancer? Where is my personal jetpack? Why isn't do I we have world peace? Because half of the maths graduates in America are working on cryptographic systems to enable secure communication between military and satellites, uh, and it was always that military industrial complex industry rather than another war zone, another war zone, another war zone. It, I guess, which a lot of war photography. Yeah, of course. And I guess from a, a an outsider's perspective looking in, it, it was just fascinating to see that whilst a lot of other photographers, if not all photographers, are in the trenches, in the battlefields, you had taken the conscious choice to go to the war zone of the future, which is the supercomputers. And was it, I guess my question is, was it, a conscious choice to do the opposite or was it just your yes. your i guess versus your, versus I mean, your I, I never curiosity. seen it i never seen anybody try and do that and and it seemed to me it was it was doable because everyone said oh, you, oh you'll never get into those places oh you'll never get on board a russia uh, a nuclear submarine oh you'll never get into a, the computer that designs america's nuclear weapons well you can you know you just got to make a case and and assemble a kind of pathway mm. uh, and to be honest the way that i did it with the supercomputers was i Photographed a whole load of uh, academic ones first, Liverpool University, Edinburgh University. I went around a whole load. Uh, I did uh, some weather computers, nice, cuddly, easy ones. Made a fo- portfolio, and then uh, 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 weird pictures of orange and green cables and and red buttons with green lights next to it. Made a beautiful little portfolio, and then I sent that to the geeks, and said, "I want to come and photograph your weapons design computer, but this is what I want to photograph." And they went, "Wow, no one's ever done this. This looks great." Okay, you can come. Because we know that you can't learn anything about our weapons designs by looking at this computer. We know that. The fool in the PR office doesn't know that, but we know that, so we'll let you in. Uh, and so, uh, uh, the, and I say this a lot to kind of students and stuff, but if you want to do something that's very, very difficult to get into, penetrate, this a little bit goes back to our conversation about charm, which I don't have, but I have a kind of rat like coming. You know, if you want to get into something like an American nuclear submarine, uh, a British nuclear, I mean, I've been on board America, a British nuclear submarine, for example, um, then you need to manufacture uh, uh, a footpath uh, in, into the place, you know. Yeah. Uh, you can't just write this. Uh, I am a student at the University of um, Swindon. Uh, I would like to come on board your nuclear secret nuclear base, please. Yours faithfully. <laughs> uh, no, never going to work. Never, never, never going to work. But if you photograph and say, oh, well, you know, uh, I'm interested in your uh, hydraulic pumps. So here's some beautiful pictures I do with hydraulic pumps in this place and that place and in a power station and in this and this. And I just want to photograph your hydraulic pumps. And while I'm there, I may do a few other things. Oh, wow. Well, okay. All right. We can see what you're up to. Uh, so you have to kind of manufacture a, 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 a journey, a, a footpath into a place, a, 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 a sort of a, a kind of menu. Uh, just 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 writing to a secret military base and saying, hello, can I come and photograph your secret military base? Is never, ever going <laughs> to produce a yes. I'm thrilled that you agreed to come and do the show because this is kind of exactly what I wanted to achieve from it. Because from the outside looking in, I looked at that project and my first takeaway that it was that you'd you know, you've done the complete opposite, and that's what fascinated me. But actually now hearing you talk about the groundwork that goes in before that, because, you know, you live in Hove, and you just said you went up to Liverpool and photographed at the university. You know, that's a that's a lot of effort. That's an awful lot of effort, and it's a lot of groundwork. Uh, well, it's in. not. It's a lot of effort, but when you do the groundwork, the, the secret is keep the groundwork cheap. But this is the work that no one don't, this is the work don't that say, no one sees. oh, you know, I have to go to Mongolia for a month, for six months to photograph the reindeer uh, uh, season or something. Mm. Uh, that's all, all your money's got. <laughs> you know, that just cost you 20 grand, right? Uh, a train ticket to Liverpool and, uh, you know, it's not, it's just a day. Make sure that the groundwork is effective, but also make sure that it doesn't cost you too much. Mm. You're on the you're on the nursery slopes. You know that's where you do the that's where you that's where you construct the path. You start on the nursery slopes, do small stuff, do stuff that's accessible, do stuff that's public facing rather than a secret facility. Do the research so that you know that the FIFO FIFO buffer in the Liverpool University computer is the same one that they use in the nuclear computer, right? Uh, okay. So I knew that that you know that that piece of kit or that that 
manufacturer or whatever is is the same one that's in the nuclear one, so yeah. it has a relevance. The, the new, so, you, know, you, you don't want to do all the groundwork and then the nuclear people turn around and go, oh yeah, ours are totally different, you're wasting your time, mate. Yeah. A lot of people say to me, oh, I want to do a project about something. Uh, it's the, you know, once every 20 years they have this amazing uh, festival in so-and-so, I need 20 grand to shoot a book about it. Uh, how do I do it? Well, you can't, can you? Because you, 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 by the time you've gone to have a look at it, you've spent all the money. You need to be able to you you need to be able to go back again and again a little bit. When you're learning how to go at something, you need to have a little look, come away, have a think, go back again, try something out, maybe come away, go out another think, and then go again to the third time, and then you get a good idea, and then the fourth time you start to make some good pictures. But if you announce you're going to do a project and it's only ever going to happen once in the entire world, and there's only one chance to sell it because it's like you know one of these um, occasions which is everything happens on a, on one day and then no one thinks about it ever again, then you'll never sell that project because three weeks later, who's interested in the year 2000, the January the 1st, the year 2000? Who's interested on that on the 5th of January? No one is interested on that on the 5th of January. Why on earth would you spend 20 grand to, to, to rent a jet to fly around every location on earth so that you photograph on the 1st of January in 26 locations that you cost you 100 grand to rent a jet through those pictures? No one's going to be interested on the 5th of January. I'm thrilled we've got onto this subject because, and if this gets uh, too personal, please just say and we can, we can move on to something else, but... Someone, a listener of the show, spoke to me the other day and they said they'd listened to Art Wolf's episode and he does a lot of travel and there's clearly a large outlay from the start from him. He's got to fund it in some way. And, mm. and the photographer I spoke to said, he said, like, I love the episode, but he said, the thing I wanted to know is how on earth does he fund the things that he does with no guaranteed outcome of what is going to come back in terms of a you know a business perspective? He's He's laying out a lot of cash with no guaranteed return. And when I was looking at your work, there's you've got a number of different revenue streams. You've got galleries, you've got books, and things that are, from the outside, making money for you and your business to give you the freedom to go and work. Is that a conscious choice? I'll tell you what's conscious. Well, I, I, I should just correct you. I never made a penny out of any of the books. The books don't make money. Right. Books are, books are shop window. But I do have editorial sales. I have my print sales a little bit. Uh, I do a little bit of teaching. Um, I think the most important conscious, chase, conscious choice that I've made is don't make your lifestyle expensive. Hmm. Right? If you want to do the kind of work that I do or that even the work that Art Wolf does, don't do it with a huge studio and staff and your own printer and your own tech person and your own producer and the rest of it. I've got a friend who's an advertising photographer. He has to turn over 240000 a year just to break even because he's got a beautiful studio, exactly right for his work. He's got a full-time printer, two, two full-time assistants and a full-time producer. And he's, uh, and he's just sent his, his, his kid to public school to make his problems even worse. And he says to me, oh, Simon, I wish I could do what you do. That's like, I'm like... Give it up, mate. You can do it. Just sell everything. You can do it. Oh no, I couldn't lose my producer. Oh, I couldn't lose that technician. It's really good. Oh, are those. I couldn't. I don't want to give up my studio space. It's a beautiful place. I'd lose it. I'd never get anything like it. Well, now now he's built a kind of golden cage around himself, and he can't go off and do that. You know, once in a lifetime project, at six months with the monkeys or whatever. You know, because he's got a very expensive golden cage that he's locked himself inside. I live really cheaply. I don't. I don't, you know, I don't spend a lot of money on anything, really, apart from Mrs. Norfolk. Uh, bicycles is about anything I spend money on. I don't have a car. Uh, I do some outrageous business shortcuts. Um, for example, I've never had a business account. Uh, I've never had any insurance on anything. I've never spent a penny on insurance my entire life. I started out uh, pretty skint, living above a Turkish restaurant, and I always bear, bear in mind that... Uh, I was happy. I was happy then. And if I have to go back to it, I can be happy in that place again. And I don't I want to ever build a kind of, um, yeah, a, a kind of gilded cage around myself where I have to do 15 commercial jobs a year to pay for my Porsche, to pay for my children's school fees, to pay for my alimony payments, to pay for my, you know, cottage in Tuscany. Uh, um, just want to go and do just because I think it looks great and interesting and uh, and will make me happy uh, and make me feel free. I want to feel free. Uh, increasingly nowadays, I want to feel free. 
I don't want anything in the way of a feeling of freedom. The only reason why you go out and earn a load of money is so that you don't feel trapped by all of the people asking you for money and the things you have to pay for, so that you feel some freedom afterwards. It's the freedom afterwards is the purpose of the exercise. And I want to feel free. And if that means not having a sports car and not having a kid at public school, I don't have children, I deliberately don't have children, pretty much, well, this is a chunk of the reason why I don't have children, but um, uh, I don't have an expensive lifestyle that needs to be maintained. I could flog all of this and go and live in a, rest in a bed set above a Turkish restaurant. And as long as Mrs. Norfolk loved me, I would still be happy. And that's all I need. That is all I need. So the rest is just extras, really. That is, that's the most important thing. And then if you're free, then you can, you know, oh, you hear something on the radio and you think, oh, okay, well, that's only going to cost me 1,500 quid to go there and I can try and do it without, you know, uh, uh, without spending too much money. And if I go at this time of year, it's cheap. Or if I try and get a little job photographing a restaurant whilst I'm there for that magazine, they'll give me 300 quid. So that's the plane ticket paid for. And if I can ask those friends of mine who are there, if I can do some stuff for them while I'm there, maybe I could do a podcast or i could do a master class or something oh wow master class that'll pay for the hotel and the flight okay well i'll do that while i'm there and then when it's finished instead of coming straight home i'll go off and do that you know afterwards uh, 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 it's another 200 miles down the road but that's nearby you just need to kind of construct these things out of building blocks like lego you know you, you build them out of lego sometimes it's like i'm not going to make money out of this until i sell a print and that's very very risky business because mm. print selling is very weird um most of you know, I, I don't know where it's the case with Art Wolf, but most of what you see of mine that goes on a gallery wall was not shot for a gallery wall, because right? I can't do that. I can't go off for a year and photograph nuclear weapons launches. It was subsidized by me parlaying off on a magazine or doing other stuff for other people whilst I was in that place while I was there or... Um, I was nearby, so I did two restaurant reviews and some pictures of the outside of a hotel, and they gave me 400 quid, and that paid for a week in the motel for me to do the next part, or something like that. Uh, and that's how you do those things. You've got to be a little bit kind of duck and weave. Um, it's very, very hard to do that nowadays, because the way that I did it doesn't exist anymore. Uh, nowadays, I guess the way that you do it is you would get on Instagram and uh, try and get three free nights in a hotel room from, you know, so-and-so hotels and you try and get a free flight off Air New Zealand and you say, see if you could like, blag uh, a new Hasselblad off Hasselblad and borrow that for two weeks. And uh, to be honest, the, the, the new generation of photographers who make all their, who live their entire lives inside the, uh, the habitat of social media are much more skilled at this kind of thing. Of like kind of ducking, you know, pulling in little bits of money from, you know, stealing from Peter to pay Paul and 200 quid here, 50 quid there, 80 quid there, a free hotel night there, a uh, half price discount on a plane ticket there, and I can do a project. It's the kind of lunk headed ones that go to universities and do MAs in the UK that are ones that think, I can't do this project until I get that £4,000 Art Council grant. And that is real block headed thinking. Mm. The, 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 the Instagrammers and stuff are the ones that are nimble and flexible with their thinking. I don't, I don't particularly want to be a sort of PR shill for luxury hotel chains and airlines, but at least their thinking is nimble. But it, the, the, the kids that I meet, they're doing MA courses. They say, I want to do a project. I'm waiting to receive a grant from the Arts Council. Well, good luck with that, mate. There's 5,000 people applied for that. Hmm. I've, never, I've, never, I've never succeeded in, in, in winning. Mean, I just don't apply for those kind of grants because I've never succeeded in winning one because it's a kind of lottery. You're up against 5,000 people and it's just madness. You'd be far better doing two restaurant reviews and uh, giving uh, half a day on a masterclass. It, it produces much money. Hmm. You know, there's a bloody Arts Council grants are only 900 quid, you know, 1,000 quid now anyway. So, uh, you know, you could make the money elsewhere, I reckon. Or even the outside of photography. I've always been a big fan of, uh, you know, those photographers that are amateur photographers that, uh, you know, they spend all day working, you know, four days a week working as a architect or something. And then they do these amazing 10 days, go off and do a piece of work that's, you know, as well funded as anybody could do. But they are, their, their full time job is somewhere else. But, what, you know, don't give a full time job up. It pays for you to, 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 to take a three week holiday and go off and do that really great project that could be a book or something. Mm. I'd, rather, I'd rather you were doing that rather than you were kind of, you know, messing about doing rubbish weddings and trying to get 50 quid here and 80 quid there and doing a local events and, a, you know, conferences and stuff like that and, and, and not really making any money at all, just drowning in a kind of everyday, day to day kind of hubba bubba and not really ever getting ahead.
if I'm taking pictures, I'm a photographer. That's the most important thing is I am a photographer. No, no, the important thing is what you put on the wall is important. How you get there is not important. Yeah. It's, it's that that will get you judged. Thank you for uh, for talking about that, because it's a very personal subject, and it's... Uh... No, no, not at all. I'm, I'm quite proud of it. My first book was paid for almost entirely by property page pictures for the Telegraph. And I'd drive up to Norfolk, and uh, you just do, and sometimes you didn't get out of the car. You just round down the window, <laughs> shot the front, <laughs> and then drive all the way back again. And I got 145 quid for each one, plus the mileage and the petrol. It's good entrepreneurship. And it, and, it, and it pretty much paid for the whole of the first book. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and it's, you know, what you said earlier about keeping it lean. And yeah. To mention oh, yeah. It, uh, sorry, I forgot to mention. It took four years to do the book. Because yes. it took four years to earn the money. But, it, but, it, but I mean, I was, I was free. I wasn't constrained by anyone else. It's important, though. And to mention him again, Peter Dench, I spoke to him and he said exactly the same thing. I said, what? I said, why do you, why do you love the UK so much? And he said, because it's accessible. He said, because mm -hmm. I can go and collect the things I want to collect for 200 quid, if needs be. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, think I, I agree very much with that. You know, a lot of, a lot of students say, oh, well, I want, to work, uh, I want to work for magazines, so I need to live in London. I, re I want to do big projects, but I'm going to pay for it by doing magazine assignments, so I need to live in London. And my first thought is, London, okay, you need two grand a month just to live in London. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, if you weren't in London and you were living in Lees, you were living in Sheffield, you were living in Huddersfield, you would instantly have a grand a month in your pocket for your project. And, you know, what you were saying about your friend earlier who has to turn over a quarter of a million pound a year just to break even, you've then got to do the jobs on top of that in order to make the profit to fund your lifestyle. That is a lot of work, which means if you do want to do a personal project, it's almost at the bottom of the... No, almost. It is at the bottom of the pile because your commercial work has to take priority in order to fund that lifestyle. And of course, there is absolutely nothing wrong with that at all. In fact, it's to be admired. If you can earn that much from something that you love, but if you do want to do a personal project, then of course, it becomes a lot harder if you have to make that kind of money. He's a brilliant, successful commercial photographer. Mm. Uh, and and he, does, he does it year in, year out. But I don't, I don't know how he puts up with the pressure, quite frankly. Uh, I love his work, and I think it's great. And he, but he, he comes to me and says, "Oh, I want to be an artist. I want to be like you." I'm like, "No, you don't." Oh, do I want to go off and do projects? No, you don't. Do what you do already. There's no snobbery about it. Oh, but I want to, people will take me more seriously as an artist. No, they won't. Huh. It's just a different machine that you get involved in. It's just picture making. It's just coloured paper stuck on a wall. There's nothing fancy about it. Um, uh, and there's no more. Um, uh, credibility or honesty to being an artist and shilling for a lot of Russian millionaires than there is for shilling for a you know a, 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 a car company with a TV commercial. Mm. Good God! When I when I first started as selling prints and was doing very well from prints, I once had a call from my gallery that said, "Have you got any pictures that have got li uh, lines? 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 Parallel lines?" <laughs> so someone's someone's come in and says, "Have you got any stuff that's got parallel lines? Because that's that's the scheme that I've got in my room, and I'm looking for some art that goes on the wall that's like this. It, basically, it's like my curtains." So someone yeah. walked into a gallery, looked at all of your walked into the photographer's gallery print room, right? So not some shithole gallery in the middle of nowhere. The gallery, the print room of the photographer's gallery, <laughs> and said, "Have you got any artists? I've got any pictures with parallel lines in." I mean, what right. I what I quite enjoy is that they went in and looked at you know the beautiful work you've done, and I'm sure many other photographers and the detail and the and the the graft that has gone into them and said, yeah, you haven't not, got not linear lines, enough. Have you? <laughs> <laughs> oh dear! Right, look, I I don't think there's um, that that you are you're the perfect guest. You, this is exactly what I wanted to achieve from from having these conversations, and I'm absolutely thrilled that you you were agreed to speak with me i'm going to ask you some quick fire questions and i guess oh really yeah and i'm not looking for anything deep i just your gut instinct really i might say why but it's just more of a gut instinct there's one that i i'm interested to know the reason but we'll come to it in a second uh, so black okay. and white or color for making pictures yes black and white black and white or color uh color well, why not that's the world is color crazy question Okay. Personal or... Oh, no. Let's leave that one because... Oh, actually, maybe not. Personal or commercial project? 
Can you say personal or political? Because Ooh. personal is political. Personal commercial project. I, I've never been asked to do any commercial projects. Well, that's why as soon as I started saying personal, I, I looked at the question and, and I, I do, stopped I do myself. Editorial. I do editorial work. Uh, and sometimes that stuff starts out as a, something that I want to do anyway and then I put it to a magazine and say hey you know and then they say oh well you can do that but you'd have to do that as well and I go oh okay alright well I'll get, at least I'll get my bit out of it uh, or it can be something where the magazine just phones up and says do you want to go and photograph the CERN nuclear collider and I just say yeah that's great and then when I get there I make something else out of it and it goes on the gallery wall but, so th there can be many routes to it but uh, I do editorial work but in my entire career, I think I've been offered commercial work about twice. I don't know why. I'm very keen to do very highly paid commercial work. I am available for weddings, bar mitzvahs, and car adverts. I just don't ever get asked. Interesting. Do you know? Never, not hardly a sausage. I did some. I did some shoes for Nike once. I was, did it very, very badly. May I ask why? Why did I do it badly? Because I'm an incompetent idiot. Sorry, what was that? You meant? <laughs> well, no, I was just interested because I'm sure you didn't do it badly. But I, just I, I see what is it. I, I very, very nearly got a job for Huawei mobile phones recently. Mm. Uh, crazy money. I mean, just mad amount of money. But I could see later on that what they wanted was somebody. They wanted someone to shoot with the phone and not manipulate the file whatsoever. Ah, uh, okay. In fact, in fact, the, the rules were going to be. I was going to take the picture on the phone. The, the phone would arrive in a briefcase that would be handcuffed to a man's hand. He would give me the phone, I would take the picture, and then he would put it back in the briefcase. And that, and that was part of this. It's shot on the phone, it really is. And also, I think they were going to send a video crew that were going to film me really shooting the picture on the phone so that no one could say, oh, you shot it on Hasselblad, and then you pretended that you shot it on the phone. Oh, sorry, they actually wanted you to shoot the phone on the phone. That, yeah, no, that's no, right. to shoot to shoot landscape pictures with the phone, but oh, to be seen I... shooting only with the phone, shooting things so that no, I couldn't. They couldn't ever turn around and say, "Oh, you shot on a much better camera, and you're only pretending to shoot on the phone." Sorry, I thought you meant it was a product shot of the phone, but they wanted no, no, to no, shoot no. the product no, on the shot. They were on going the to fly phone. me all around the bloody world. Wow, goodness me! Sydney Harbour Bridge, the Eiffel Tower, something. Like it was all over the place, and then, and the money was stupid amount of money, but. Um, but I can see what they really wanted was not a photographer. They wanted a, a kind of um, uh, purity, you mm. know, like an integrity thing. Yes. That's what, what, that's what they were buying. Yeah, was the, of course. You know, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm probably not a swindler. Yeah, yeah. And, and the file is utterly unmanipulated. I, never even, I, I would never even see, I would never even have possession of the files. Because man, I, I said, because I said oh, can, I, can, I have the, can I have the phone first, have a play with it? And they were like, no. A man will arrive with it handcuffed to his wrist. Because <laughs> it's not for sale yet, you Of see. course, yeah, of course. Wow, goodness me. Okay. You see, it was the, the Huawei P40. That's what I love about these conversations. I had n no inkling that we would ever end up down that avenue of uh, phone photography. All right, Prime or Zoom? <laughs> I've never owned a Zoom in my life. I've never owned a Zoom. To be honest, I don't really own any much in the way of cameras. Uh, I only have that one at a time anyway. I've never, I've never owned a Zoom. Not in... ever. Why, why have you never owned a Zoom? Well, they're shit and they're slow and they're heavy <laughs> and the glass isn't very good. I don't do a lot of... Uh, I never do a lot of dashing about stuff. Mm. Not even uh, in your, in your uh, journalist days? No, I was much more a kind of portraits and features and stuff like that. Mm. Uh, you know, I did a big feature about lawnmower racing. That was about the high point of my career in the newspapers. Um, so, I mean, having fancy zooms and stuff never really wouldn't have done any difference. No, mm. just a thirty-five, eighty-five, a, a two hundred in the bag with dust on it. Never, never had a wide lens. Uh, never, I never owned a thirty-five mil digital camera in my life. Oh, no, I've got a Sony. I've got a Sony now, yes, but that's all. Do you... I'm not interested in cameras. Well, like, I'm not interested in photography, really, either. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think, well, actually, this, this, is, I think this is an important point, though, because Martin Hartley... You don't, have to, you, don't, you don't have to be interested in photography. I find, I meet a lot of... I do a lot of classes, and I find when I talk to students, MA students, they are very knowledgeable about photography, mm. photographers, and even cameras and technical stuff, whatever. Uh, but they know nothing about any other art form. They don't know about jazz or ballet or 
kabuki theatre or, mm. you know. Um, when I do these uh, master classes for, um, I don't call them master classes anymore, but when I do these kind of classes, uh, you know, where you pay four days for me in a, you know, Tuscan castle or something, uh, I always get a kind of, uh, I often get a kind of older crowd, but I often get a crowd that is quite financially secure. They've got a job as an architect or something, but they've just got to the point in their career where it's all fine, it's ticking over, they're doing well, quite well out of it financially, but they're kind of bored. And they want to do photography because it will be exciting and they'll feel that they're in control. Instead of sitting in meetings, they're out going out doing stuff. They want to be landscape photographers because it sounds like the opposite of being stuck in an office somewhere. Um, and they're not going to give up their jobs and uh, as architects and become photographers. They just want to become better amateurs. And I am absolutely fine with that. And the one thing I really like about these people, and my friends disparagingly call them the orthodontists, right? Because they're often, they are orthodontists. <laughs> and often they have gold likers and nearly always they have better cameras than I can afford, that's for sure. And they've got portfolios of like, my God, you went to Kazakhstan and Peru and uh, Mongolia and the North Pole in the same year. Wow. Right? So, yeah, they've yeah, they got, got plenty of money. But what I like about those people, what I really like about those people is they don't know that much about photography, but they also, but they do know a little bit about the ballet, and they occasionally go to the theatre, mm. and they've been to the opera a few times, and they go and see a painting show, and they went to see that exhibition at the British Museum about the Vikings, and etc. 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 And and I find that much more exciting rather than sitting in the room with some photography drone that can name every single person that won the Deutsche Börse Prize going back to 1974 or something like that. Mm. I think if you spend your entire life looking at other photographers, eventually your photography will end up looking like the work of other photographers. You are chasing your tail. Yeah. And again, you know, it's been one of the constant themes of this show is exactly what you've just said. Uh, so many photographers say they they enjoy paintings, they enjoy film, theatre, and they take inspiration from all of those different mediums in order to form their photography, not yeah. looking at other photographers. And, yeah. and I think you can get a bit obsessed of like you know what you know what so and so's new show and this you know who's got this who's won a prize and who's in Mag who's joined Magnum and who's got an award and who's being published in New York Times. It, it, it just seems like a kind of a recipe for biting your own tail, if you ask me. The, there's two things actually that you mentioned there which I'd, I'd like to just look at briefly uh, one of them is that someone once said to me because I trained as an actor and someone said to me that the best oh. advice someone said to me was you need to play your own game because they said you can get so caught up in exactly what you just said uh, having one eye on everyone else's work what everyone else is doing and they said focus play your own game it doesn't matter what anyone else is doing yeah. what are you doing is yeah, that yeah, something yeah. that has been? Is that something that you have consciously done throughout your career? Well, I think it goes back to what I'm saying about what, you know. At the end of it, after all these other things, you know, the ambition that you got to win that money or win that prize, or whatever, is because you wanted the freedom that came after that. Mm -hmm. And for me, you can pay too too high a price for the freedom. You know, that's my that's my friend in the gilded cage, my friend the commercial photographer in the gilded cage. Yes, and you can actually go from here straight to freedom without dicking about. If you just reduce your ambition a little bit, mm -hmm. uh, take your own path, um, be confident in your own designs that your own design will get you to where you want. You don't have to go the same route that everyone else has gone because a lot of those people are idiots and they are walking off a cliff collectively. Mm. Uh, and you've got to be kind of confident that your own path can do it. And then also I think a little bit you've got to kind of reduce your cloth a little bit. You know, if you set off that you want to be rich and you want to have a fancy car and a big house and a villa in Tuscany and a sports car, then you are going to be shooting crap for the rest of your life to pay for it. I can be free to just stop and walk away if I want to. Wouldn't be the end of the world. I may even do that, thinking about it. Uh, or I could uh, disappear off for six months. Uh, and it probably wouldn't cost too much. And it wouldn't bankrupt me because of the way I shoot stuff is always quite lo-fi and quite kind of string and cardboard anyway um, uh, and then I can please myself and at the end of the day the only reason I did all that commercial work and won all that money was so that I'd have enough money in the bank that I could please myself Yeah. so why don't you just go from here to please yourself directly hmm. it's a great philosophy very very good and it's, again it's exactly what I think a lot about freedom these days yeah the, the... No, one, no, one ever, no one ever uses the word in this country Americans do in a completely different way. Yes, Americans do very much so. 
I think, I think it's I think it's kind of COVID and stuff like that has has given me has certainly made me start thinking a lot more about you know what is the actual point of the things that we do and what what is the what what is the actual end goal you know mm. you want to be free to pick and choose and follow your nose that's what I want to do yeah the second thing. I mean, that would have been the perfect way to end this conversation. But the second thing... Well, no, we're working through your daft list of either or. Zoom, telephoto, go on, there's something else. <laughs> well, no, no, there's not actually. It was it, this, this was the second thing which actually led on from Prime or Zoom because you said that you uh, you only had a, a very... Uh, a couple of a handful of lenses uh, or primes. And again, it's back to the parameters thing earlier. Do you think having less choice yeah, gives yeah. you more creativity? Yeah, yeah, totally, yeah. yeah. Same camera bag goes on every job. I don't have a big cover for the lenses that I, ooh, what am I going to be today? Ooh, you know, should I take the 600? <laughs> no. no. <laughs> it needs wheels. Why would you want to carry that thing around? <laughs> no, no, just keep it simple. The the clever stuff is done inside your head. Yes. Well, not with a stupid lens or, uh, you know, more megapixels or something. You know, the clever stuff is done with the research and the compositing an idea and making it sophisticated, making it fresh, making it something people have never seen before, making it something that aligns deeply with your philosophy. I, you know, uh, you can... I, I spent a lot of time faking it as a photographer. You know, I, for a long time I wanted to be a news photographer. I, could, I was a competent news photographer, but I was never a good one. Mm. I was. I spent a lot of time doing portraits. I was fine. You know, my portraits were fine, but I was never good at it. You know, I could probably. I remember doing. I remember photographing sport ones. Right, the only thing I learned that day was I am not a sport photographer. <laughs> I am not a sport photographer. Um, I, I'm, I'm a. Pre, I'm a pretty good landscape photographer. Yeah, very, that's all. I, that's all I want to be. You're a very good landscape photographer, and actually, this kind of leads me on to this. This will be my last one of, of either or, and I think I know the answer, but I'm interested to know why tripod or handheld oh for god's sake i know the answer but it's the why that i'm interested in i haven't taken a picture without a tripod since about 1999 i know <laughs> um a tripod i mean a 5.4 of course is always tripod and even now i put everything on a tripod just because it's about stopping and slowing down and precision and uh shooting less with making it count mm -hmm. so i i even put small cameras on tripods just because yeah, it's more about precision and, and and just taking the time to think, is is this going to achieve all the things that I actually set out to do today? Or can I actually make it better by being a little bit further up the hill or staying over there or coming back when the light's from the left-hand side or doing it in winter when it's covered in snow or something else? Uh and the tripod just allows you that that brief pause. When when we do when I do these classes that I do, I make everyone shoot on tripods. They hate it because they never use them, and they all turn up with tripods that look like they're made out of spaghetti, just just <laughs> garbage. Things that wobble when you breathe on them. Uh, but towards the end of the class, they always say, "Yeah, I love shooting with a tripod. I actually have really enjoyed it because it's made me slow down and think." And it's uh, that's the that's the precious part. Mm. And, and the pictures that have satisfied me the most are not just those that are, uh, you know, won a prize, whatever. The, the pictures, the best pictures, and I've only shot about five in my entire life, but the best pictures I've ever shot are those where all those things that I walked out the door looking for that morning that were on my shoot list, that were in my plan, that were in my shirt, all of those kind of docked, you know, all five of them docked at the same time on top of each other, you know, and it was all the things that you went out looking for and you brought them all home at the same time in the same place. Very, very rarely happens. Despite all my planning and all my instructions and stuff, I think I've only ever done it about six or seven times in my entire career. But yeah, that's better than some people do, you know. Hmm. Simon Norfolk, you are everything that I wanted and more to achieve from this podcast, and I cannot thank you enough for your time. And I feel like I could talk to you all day. I've got a million and one questions that I've been scribbling down, so maybe, who knows, at some point we might be able to do a part oh, okay, two. Yeah. Who knows? But um, honestly, yes, thank you. If you like, yes. Not not today because the Tour de France is reaching a very exciting conclusion this afternoon. Excellent. Or, uh, approaching a conclusion. Yeah. But um, but honestly, thank you from the bottom of my heart. This is it's exactly what I wanted to achieve from from Great. speaking oh, with Tom. Great. Oh, very happy. So, uh, it's you. been good fun. I enjoyed it. Good. Good. I'm pleased to hear it.
That was my conversation with none other than Mr. Simon Norfolk. A huge, huge thank you to Simon, as always, for taking the time to speak with me and feature as a guest on the show. I do hope you enjoyed listening to him as much as I enjoyed speaking with him. And as is often the case, Simon and I spoke for over two hours by the time we'd hit record, and I still feel like we only scratched the surface. So... Who knows, hopefully we may be able to get him back on for part two at some point. Don't forget, if there is someone that you would like to hear personally on the show, do hit me up on the Twittergrams at Matthew D. A. Walker. And if you can find time to leave a review, it goes without saying, it is hugely appreciated and really does help secure the finest photographers in the world with very busy schedules for now thank you for spending a small portion of your day with me it's been an absolute pleasure i've been matthew walker he has been simon norfolk and you have been sensational until next time take care